Illinois advances to the Elite Eight. 72-69 was the final score overall. I, I'm sorry, Iowa State. I can barely uh, contain myself, Car. Sometimes we do these videos, man, and there's certain teams we grow to like or have an affection for just because we cover them so much or we like the way they play. It's entertaining, whatever. I have chills talking about this with Illinois. I genuinely really like this team, and I have always had respect for Brad, as people know. But I just I'm enjoying this so much. I think this is so cool. This team is so fun to watch, so unselfish. Taryn Shannon is doing something generational right now. And uh, look, I thought this was kind of an ugly game at spots. And Illinois did what great teams do. They survived. They sustained it. And more importantly, they asserted that they were the better team from the jump. Uh, it never really felt to me, even for one second, that Illinois was not the better team in this game, despite whatever the metrics would say. What did you see last night and how you feeling for your Illini? Yeah, I mean, uh, to be honest with you, if I'm the Illini, you do the whole, like, box score thing. Did I play extreme? They won this game only 40% from the field, 30% from three, 51% from the line. If they make their free throws and rebound a little bit better in this game, then yeah, they might they might have won this a little bit more easily. But like I think it was close because Illinois was able to get out to that very fast start where Iowa State had that what seems to be like a classic at this point six to seven minute stretch where they can't score the basketball and they only had six points at around the ten minute mark of the first half, um, and then it got a little dicey because of turnovers and things like that. Um, Iowa State kind of got the game to where they like to play it in the second half where they weren't like playing from super behind and the game was very muddy, kind of the point that you talked to where it got kind of ugly, especially in that second half. And even when it got ugly and Terrence Shannon picked up four fouls, it was just guys making big plays. Damas making a big shot. Coleman, step back. Hawkins, as some refer to him, was able to make some big shots. And even Lucas McDavid Goody was able to come off the bench and knock down the, what, what is McDavid coming from? He just earned the middle name treatment from you? Yeah, you you hit two threes in a game where another team is coming back. You get a, you get anointed a nickname. And for him, it's McDavid. Any elaboration on how it became McDavid? I, I, it's like, you ever had that moment where something just speaks to you? Lucas McDavid. It, it was like a set of car headlights that went past my house right after that three. And like the flash just set off something in me. And I was like... Lucas McDavid Goody. Mm. I you know how I wanted to get DJ Burns his own candy bar? I'm working on a goodie bar. I think a goodie bar would go crazy. Yeah, and pretty easy because isn't there already like a good bar? Like just slap an E on the end of it. It could work really nicely. Uh okay. So there's a lot to talk about within this game that is interesting to me. It starts and ends with Terrence Shannon, though. Uh, what we're seeing from him right now is like stupid levels of good like i just he played 22 minutes in this game car he had foul trouble he played 22 minutes and he finishes with 29 uh five rebounds two assists but like so efficient like four threes 40 percent from three six for nine from two he's so unstoppable in transition and in the preview we did kind of speculate like oh what if iowa state can just take him out of transition and his game really does. When he's not getting out in transition, it relies on just, is he hitting his shots from three that night? And tonight he was. He was hitting them early. He did have a little bit of a dry spell late in the first half, but this was one of his most complete offensive performances because it happened both in the half court and in transition. And he left points out there, man. He only shot five for 10 from the free throw line. This could have been a 34-point night if he was making his free throws I, in 22 minutes. Like, let me, let me say that again. In 22 minutes, imagine if he wasn't in foul trouble and played 18 more minutes in this game. Uh, look, Zach Eady is the best player in college basketball. I still believe that. Terrence Shannon is playing as good as him in this tournament. And we got two guys from the Big Ten that are making this their tournament right now. And, and it's great to see. It's incredible to watch. Yeah, uh, Terrence Shannon is just in another – he's on another planet right now. He's in another mode. And even when he wasn't in transition in this game – in the half court, he was aggressive. They're setting the picks. He was getting downhill. He was making, you know, being acrobatic, being strong at the rim. He was hitting the threes. I mean, the the fact that I, I you just get baffled that this man put up 29 points in 22 minutes and like he missed five free throws. This could have been a 40 ball. This could have been even more generational of a performance. So it's like 
you know, he was just able to make so many plays and then three steals on top of that, including the night night steal at the end of the game to put it away. Like just, just being just, just great players doing great things is basically what that was. And, uh, and they needed all 29 of those points too, by the way, because, you know, Marcus Damas struggled from the field two for 11, didn't get much from like guys like Gary A. Coleman chipped in four for eight, Dane off the bench, three for six, Goody with the two threes. Like they did have something from somebody else, but this wasn't like, this wasn't a, uh, a Damas masterclass by, by any means, you know, he had five assists, four turnovers in this game. Uh, the doubles seemed to str- he seemed to struggle with the double team when it was on the wing, um, but yeah, uh, Shannon was just he was doing best player on the team, best player in the tourney type shit, and it's it's crazy right now that it's really two Big Ten players that are the two best players in the tournament right now. Like Zach Eady and Terrence Shannon Jr. are running the NCAA tournament right now. We're in that world. Listen, we're not going to look too far ahead. Because we will do a preview of UConn, Illinois today. That'll be up on the channel, and you would be an insane person. You should be uh, uh, putting in asylum if you look past UConn. With that said, with the way Terrence Shannon is playing right now, that might be the one player in this tournament UConn doesn't want to see. <laughs> and it's going to be really fun to watch. It's going to be interesting. Um, Damask, you touched on him quickly. And to me, I think we did nail this. I'll give us some credit in the preview. Uh, oh, wait, sorry. I have a Terrence Shannon stat. How dare I forget my number? Second player, shout out to Jared Burson on Twitter for pulling this. Second player in 30 years to score 25 or more points on 50% from the floor or better in three straight tournament games on the way to an Elite Eight run. The first player was Blake Griffin. So, like, we're seeing generational stuff from Terrence Shannon right now. It's special. And uh, it also, like... I swear it feels like this is like his baseline. Like, obviously he's not going to make threes every game, but like he can get 25 in his sleep, just getting out and being unstoppable in transition. It's crazy. And honestly, I think getting out of the big 10 has helped him a little bit there too. Not that he wasn't doing this to the big 10 as well, but these games are a little more open. The way they're officiated usually tends to lend itself to avoiding foul trouble or maybe, I don't know, just allowing him to get out and draw contact. And I think uh, it's working really, really nicely. Marcus Damask, we said in the preview, give us some credit. Uh, this game was likely going to not be a Damask game because of the way they trapped the post. And in the first half, I thought Illinois was shredding them because of Damask passing. Now, he he only finished with five assists in this game and four turnovers, but he was really comfortable. He was really, really comfortable knowing the doubles were going to come, making the right play. A lot of hockey assists. Like, if he kicked it to Coleman and Coleman made the extra pass, it was it was action that started with Damask making the right read and resulted in wide-open shots. Uh, I do think it's extremely impressive on a night where he was two for 11, couldn't really buy a shot when he did get looks. Marcus Damask, the only guy in this game that played 40 minutes. He didn't come off the floor, and the entire game plan for both teams was predicated around him. Iowa State said, we're going to stop him. We're going to send doubles. Illinois said, we're going to play through him through the doubles, and he's going to make passes to other guys, and other guys will make shots. And um, Really impressive. One of the more... One of the most impressive games I've seen where a guy struggles with his shot in that fashion, and I still felt like he influenced the game in such an impressive way. Yeah, it's just... It's such a a luxury to have that Damask is able to do the creation thing because it's, you know, we, we talked about in previous years, how a point guard and that was, and that's kind of what we, we said, we said a point guard would take pressure off Terrence Shannon Jr. Being able to do some of the, the ball distribution things. And Damask is that guy, even though he's not the point guard for this basketball team, he just initiates so many things. Coleman helps with it as well in conjunction with Shannon. So it just, it loosened things up for everybody else. And it's just such a luxury to have because, you know, obviously this is not a Damask game because of Iowa State's defensive scheme. But that that's not to say that next game, like he's not going to be able to be in that same spot and make the play and or score depending on what the defense does. He just has the versatility to kind of punish uh, teams, especially with his passing, even if the shot isn't falling, which it wasn't yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, he kind of, as crazy as it is, on a night where Shannon was so clearly the alpha and the best player, like Damask still was maybe the most important guy, at least in the half-court offense. Like, everything ran through him. And it's 
it's why I'm so impressed with Illinois. Like they, they just have these two killers that can share the ball and pick their spots. And you saw when Illinois was trying to melt the game away late, like Shannon, Shannon would help beat the full court pressure and then give the ball to Damask and get out of the way. And that speaks to the unselfishness of the, these two as a tandem. Uh, Coleman, a really, really good Coleman game. We said we needed a really, really good Coleman game. And uh, I think we're at the point with Coleman where his, I don't know, his box score lines are never that impressive, mostly because Damask and Shannon are doing so much. But, like, at this point, he's he's solid. And that's the biggest praise I can give Coleman Hawkins is you you – don't have anything unexpected from him anymore. You know what you're getting night in and night out. He finished with 12, six rebounds, three assists to zero turnovers, two steals, four for eight from the floor, two for five from three. Uh, I was just really impressed with him. Thought he was great defensively. And he had the greatest steal attempt in the history of college basketball. That that dive will be spoken from for years from now. Um, uh, by the way, we got to throw it out there. If that would have cost them a three, like them hit like I, I know I know it's funny to look back on right now, but Coleman, my brother in Champagne, like why are we diving for that right there in that situation? This just a funny situation. But Coleman's just been solid all around, making the right play. Also, just like timely shots, like things weren't going well, and then Coleman just hit the step back three. And every time Coleman got a rebound in this game, the push, and even if he didn't get the assist, him pushing, passing ahead led to so many good things. I think for Illinois, it's just. Uh, we we talked about Coleman having the advantage and being able to affect the game in a lot of different ways. Um, and he was able to do that in this game. He was all over the place. Like you said, 12.6 rebounds, three assists, two steals. I mean, he just did the Coleman thing, did a little bit of everything, had the Coleman moment with the dive, which is just hilarious. You watch that on loop if you want to. And, uh, you know, they, he made some really big plays. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this Illinois team is just like, I don't know, man. Don't they feel special? Like, regardless of what happens from here, like, wouldn't you kind of circle this team as the team that we follow the most this year? That it it just feels like something special is happening. I guess you could say the same with Purdue. You definitely can say the same with Purdue. Yeah. But it, it, it's like Purdue knew they were supposed to be special, and that's not to take anything away from them. They lived up to the expectations for the most part. This Illinois team feels like they stumbled into something special and are just so joyous in the fact that they did. And now, like, they're hitting the podium and doing chair pranks. Brad's got the super soaker. Like, the bench is so engaged. For all the times you and I have talked about vibe checks and what's the body language like at Illinois, like, I mean, man, this this team is in such a healthy spot. This program is in such a healthy spot. Even the guys that aren't getting off the bench are like willing this team to wins and so joyful in doing so. I'm I'm just enjoying watching it, man. I'm a fan of this. Yeah. The vibes are high right now. Like they're doing, they're doing something they haven't done in what 19 years. Like they, they had literally like first it was just get to the, get just get to the second weekend. And then damn near house money at that point. Now it's like super house money. You find yourself at this point where you're now, have a chance to beat one of the better teams in the country with a chance to go to the final four and you're having a good time while doing it. So the vibes are extremely high. Big 10 is back. When you get one win away from a final four though, can you actually like, are you allowed to pull the house money card? Cause I agree with you. Like this win was house money to me. I think if they had lost this game, nobody's kicking themselves. It's like great run. We got this week 16. But when you get one win away, even if you're uh, going it, up against the dynasty, no, nah, it's house money because you're going up against you're going up against UConn. But all it takes is forty minutes, man. All it takes is forty minutes. It's, it's house money when you're going up against UConn. Okay, all right. I'm just checking. Um, one thing that really impresses me about Illinois right now is you mentioned Goody, Lucas McDavid, Goody. Dane was also on the court late. There was a moment late where those two are both on the court in crunch time, making important plays. Like Luke Goody stepping up to the free throw line. Uh, Dane was, he had a dunk right before that. And I kind of just like looked up and realized both of these guys had games, like a huge stretch of the season where they didn't play. Like Goody, Goody at the end of conference play, we were talking like, is he done? And he was playing single digit minutes every single game. And Dane never took his warmups off at times this season. And for those guys to like be mature enough to deal with those ups and downs, like let's, you know what? 
let's be pointed about some shit for a second. If somebody faced adversity on last year's team of that caliber, they might have left midseason. And instead, this year, the maturity of guys like Goody and Dane to just kind of take that and know that it's for the bigger picture and the good of the team and then be ready at the biggest moment of the season and playing great basketball, contributing to a win. And like tonight, it's Harmon who barely played, which I would like to ask you on even. But like, I, I just, I don't know. I love it. It's it's a healthy program and a healthy culture when that's the way guys are operating. And uh, I it felt so notable to me that Goody and Danger, after all they've been through this season, were a huge part of this game on the court in the biggest moments. Yeah, classic coach speak, but like, you, there is there is something to be said about guys that can just stay ready and be ready for the moment. And like, especially with Goody, not to take something away from Dane, but Goody is like the all-time vibes guy on this Illinois team. Like, even when he wasn't playing, everyone loved him. He loved it. He was the main, like, story of all, of like, you know, the players' videos, Snapchats, whatever it might be. Like, this team loves Luke Goody, and Brad loves Luke Goody, even if he, even when he wasn't playing him. And there are some things about Luke Goody having some a, a bothersome, like, ankle injury that might have played into that as well. But, like, having this type of guy on the team – when you could be the vibes guy, but also be ready when you're called upon to play 28 minutes in an, in a sweet 16 game when your star player is in foul trouble and you're able to come in and knock down two big shots, knock down two big free throws too, by the way, a guy who's a 61% three uh, free throw shooter on the year hasn't had a lot of attempts because of his playing time being down and you step up and you knock down two free throws when they need it. Uh, it's just, it's, it's a credit to him being able to be ready and step up in that moment and, you know, you don't just you don't just earn middle names by just strolling out there and doing a couple things here or there. You you earn the McDavid middle name when you do things like that. What was up with the free throw line this game? And is that a concern against UConn? Uh it it's a little bit of a concern, in my opinion. It is because uh, I mean, I guess with Shannon, I'm not as concerned, to be honest. But like the mask going 0 for 4. I'm sorry. Oh, I read the wrong thing. My apologies. I was reading. Three pointers. That's that's on me. It was basically uh, Shannon, but then you had guys go to like Holman and Quincy were both two for four. Dane's a bad free throw shooter, one for four. Tyron, yeah, so like I, I, you know the Dane ones. It's like shit. You got one for four. Like <laughs> that's good for Dane. Uh, <laughs> Shannon, when it, when, it, when it's Shannon though, it's like I think he'll shake that off. And it, he's the type of guy who's that good of a free throw shooter where he can step up, and I think he can mentally be like, all right, just just make the damn free throw. Yeah. Shannon's an interesting one, man, because, like, for as good as he is, and he's no doubt the second best player in the sport, maybe you can argue he's the best player in this tournament. That's fine with me. But, like, I still feel like I have no idea how good of a shooter he is. I have no idea. Like, is is this dude a great shooter or is he an average shooter? I have no idea. I think he's – I think he's – I think he's just streaky. But he's good at the same time because he shoots 40% from three. Like, I don't think you can call well, him they, a bad three-point shooter. When he, he, shoots doesn't, 40%. Shoot, he doesn't shoot 40% from three. And that's why this is unique. So, did, wait, wait a minute. Did Coy lie to us or did he cherry pick stats? I don't know. I don't know what you're referring to with Coy. But, uh, okay, maybe it was this. Maybe he mentioned like this tournament he's shooting 40% from three. So, maybe. Shannon, this this is why I'm saying I, I don't know how good of a shooter he is. Shannon on the season is shooting 36% from three, but on hella attempts, 77 for 212. And a lot of those attempts are tough, like off the dribble things. He's, uh, he's, he's streaky. He's an 80% free throw shooter on the season. And that includes this game where he went five for 10. But you go back a year. Last year, Taron Shannon shot 32% from three on 156 attempts. And he's never shot 40% from three in a season in his career. He's a career 34% shooter. So, like, th- look, saying someone's a 34% shooter, that's not even bad, especially given the type of attempts that he takes. I just, like, I, to your point and Coy's point, I think, there are games it feels like he's a 50% shooter from three. You can't leave him open. He's a superstar. And then there's games where he goes five for 10 from free throw. I have no idea how good of a shooter he is. And I never will know. <laughs> I, I just think he's very streaky. That, that's literally it. And I think it's not even with threes. I just think he's very streaky in general. Like even the pull-up jumper is streaky. Yeah. Well, it's a great streak right now. Uh, Iowa State. Don't want to leave them completely out of this recap. Sorry, Iowa State fans, if you stumble into this. We're, uh, we're very Illinois heavily influenced show these days. 
What'd you make of their performance? Curtis Jones was awesome, 26 off the bench, but man, they did not get enough offensively from anybody in the starting lineup. Yeah, they just, they they couldn't, and they got a very, very good game from Curtis Jones, who was able to pour in 26 points in this game, but they they just, they did the thing where they went long stretches without scoring, and during those long stretches, they weren't able to even get enough stops with Illinois, and it got them in a position where they aren't comfortable, like playing from behind. Now, credit to them, they were able to kind of dig their heels in in the second half and get it close. Um, a lot of that came with Terrence Shannon being in foul trouble and things like that, but they were still able to get that game very close. They just they just didn't have the offensive firepower. Like we talked about it in the pregame, that guys like Mopchilovic would need to step up, uh, Lipsy would need to step up, Gilbert, and those guys just, you know, did Mopchilovic only score one point in this game, over four from the field. Um, did we lie to people about Milan or, or were we lied to about Milan? Because this is an unacceptable performance from him. Yeah, I think just uh, I don't think we I don't think we lied to. Uh, I don't think we lied to anybody. I think that I think Coleman did a great job on him, and also I think he's just a freshman, a freshman that like I don't know. A lot of his stuff would comes from like people being able to create for him, and I feel like he didn't get a lot created for him. I don't know. He, a lot of his stuff is like these tough ugly shots too though right like sometimes he's there give him the ball get out of the way guy and he makes i kind of i kind of honestly i kind of just wish he shot more yeah that was my thing was like at bare minimum i expected him to go out like trying and create some of these like tough fadeaway shots that you know if you can't get a good look milan has been a guy this season they do just get a good look from give him the ball and he hits something that looks really tough um he didn't even try that in this game it was over four from the floor just an unacceptable performance and I get it. He's a freshman, but this team needed more from him and he's been so consistent for them this season. That's been a big part of why we've been touting that he's one of the best freshmen in the country. I mean, he had months at a time where he scored in double figures every single game. He had four straight double figure scoring games coming into this one and he was damn near unplayable tonight. Um, I do think you should give Illinois credit. They clearly are playing better defensively right now than they have at times this season with that said i do think iowa state missed a lot of really good looks in this game they missed a lot around the rim bro they missed they missed so many layups so yeah, many layups yeah. and Which, i'm, I'm no, go ahead. no i just like it, it doesn't feel a little ominous like again i don't want to be the huge skeptic here because i love the way illinois is playing but coming into this one we were like competition and then they do this to Iowa State, which was impressive. But, like, coming away from a three-point win against Iowa State where Iowa State shot, like, 35% at the rim. Yeah, I, uh, it's it's hard not to do the uh, – let's just say the next team they're playing is not one that misses a lot of layups or twos. You had to catch yourself, though, because Donovan Klingon does miss layups. Yeah, uh, part of the team does, though. Yeah, Okay. We'll do a preview. I just, I don't know. It's weird. I felt like Illinois dominated this game more than the scoreboard shows. But I also felt like Iowa State missed a bunch of very easy shots. So, I don't know. I don't know what to do with that. Um, Otts and Brad, I thought Brad had a masterpiece in this game. I thought he coached circles around Otts. And, look, I think it's clear at this point we can put all the Brad skeptic stuff to bed like the, the only thing brad didn't have on his resume was ncaa tournament success now he has a little bit of it and i don't like defining coaches by like saying they're a good or bad coach based on what they do in march i think that always misses the point it, it marches for legacy not for caliber not speaking to how good you actually are march is just legacy points and legacy points matter and brad is earning those legacy points as we speak with that said uh, he's got a lot of criticism as a guy who doesn't make adjustments, doesn't have much of a plan, just kind of yells at his guys and watches shit unfold, right? Not in this one. I thought this was a Brad masterpiece. I thought the way he managed the rotations in this game was stellar. I thought his offensive game plan of playing through the mask into the double teams was stellar. I thought uh, he adjusted in the middle of the game when – you know, it, it became clear Damask like didn't even have a shot attempt for a while early in this game. 
and you want to keep your guy engaged. Even if he's not shooting well, you want to keep him engaged. You can't just have him only be a passer when you're a player as good as Marcus Damask. So they pivoted. They started initiating him backing down from the top of the key instead of from the side because Iowa State doesn't double from the top of the key. I thought that was a great little wrinkle that got Marcus Damask more engaged and kept him going. I just loved it. I thought Brad was putting on a coaching clinic in this game, and I thought Otts had no idea what he was doing defensively in the first half. I can speak to that more. But what did you see on the the head-to-head coaching? Yeah, uh, it was – honestly, it was a pretty good battle all around because I thought that, like you said, Underwood did a great job of making that middle adjustment when he sent Damas to the middle so they weren't able to double-team. But then Otts was able to kind of throw some other wrinkles in there where they were able to kind of utilize their quick hands as well to get steals. So it was a good coaching match back and forth. But look, like you stated, Brad, it always was, well, uh, well, yeah, he's a good coach. Yeah, th- those Big Ten wins, like, yes, whatever the stat is, they got the most Big Ten wins over the last five seasons outside of Purdue or whatever that stat may be. Now that he has this March run and March success to back that up, I think it just stamps of what we thought of him that he is, you know, that he is a good coach. Um, and it doesn't give people that opening that avenue to be like, oh, but what has he done in March, basically? Um, because he's, I mean, he's on a great run right now. And there's even more glory on the horizon for him. Like this, oh. I'm I'm just saying like, this is, this could be the start of like a, a legendary run. Like it was a good run. Like, don't get me wrong, but it was more head state Duquesne. There's no blink in it being Iowa State. Iowa State, you know how we feel about Iowa State. I, I understand what was being said about them. That's still a damn good basketball team that just struggles offensively a little bit, but they're a damn good team. Uh, now there's there's glory on the horizon and because, you know, who knows? I'm just saying. I get excited every time I hear the G word thrown out by you on a podcast. I mean – a run of a run of I you run that should be Iowa State UConn to go to the Final Four, and then on the horizon is what Clemson or Bama. Yes, yeah, some some would say the winner of Illinois UConn will be in the national championship. Some would. I won't disrespect I, Mark Sears. I that, but some, I, some would. I'm not disrespecting Mark Sears. The winner of Illinois UConn will be in the national championship game. That feels a little disrespectful. We'll see. Um, yeah, I just, on my odds point, I thought in the first half, I was complaining about this in the Discord, or not complaining, but just noting it. Uh, Ott's, Iowa State's defense was running out to the wrong guys. Like, it, it looked to me literally like they didn't scout Illinois' players on an individual basis because they were sending the doubles at Damask, but then Damask would kick out to, like, Coleman, and, and they Coleman, sprint out to him and leave Shannon open in the corner. It was yeah, weird. or uh, like Coleman would swing to Ty Rogers, and you've got two guys running Rogers off the line at the expense of leaving Shannon wide open. They were also uh, like in the full court. If they were bringing the full court pressure, like they would trap near half court and just leave Terrence Shannon wide open, streaking to the rim. It's like, and I said this, and they did this. They pivoted in the second half and did a better job of it, but. You have to just mark Shannon at all times. I don't care what your defensive scheme is. Like, the way Illinois is built, do the doubles on the mass, do the traps, whatever you want, but keep one guy on Shannon at all times. Like, damn near face guard him. You have to. He's that good. And I think this scheme would have worked really well if they would have done that and tried to make guys like Ty Rogers and Quincy Garrier or even Luke Goody beat them. And they didn't. They let Terrence Shannon beat them. Like, let's let's be extremely clear about this. They had to play from behind the entire game because they let Terrence Shannon beat them. And that's not to take anything away from Shannon because Shannon was awesome. But Shannon got more open looks in the first 10 minutes of this game than he's gotten in the entire Big Ten season. And yes, that is a credit to Illinois' offense. It's a credit to Marcus Damas passing. It's a credit to the unselfishness. But it's a huge indictment on Otz's ability to get his team to execute a scout. Because how do you leave the best player on the court wide open repeatedly for the first 10 minutes of this game? It was insane yeah. to me. And no, no matter what your scout is, there, there's always a cardinal rule. Don't leave the best player on the floor wide open. Especially when especially when that best player, you give them those few open ones and let them see some go in, and then that's when it really pours in. The next thing you know, it's 10 minutes in the first half, and that player has 15 points. 
Yeah. Yeah, it was brutal. And look, again, it doesn't take anything away from them, but I just thought it was a weak scout. And then the second half, it was a lot better. Shannon didn't get anything easy for the first 10 minutes of the second half before he went to the bench with foul trouble. So um, I don't know if if they would have been that locked in and marking Shannon in the first half. I think this is a completely different game, but they didn't. So here we are. Yeah. All right. I was th- I was stayed out scored them by seven in the second half. They were right there. It was 51 50. I think it was 51 51 at some point, maybe 61 61, something like that. Like it was it was dicey. Yeah, Iowa State never led, which is crazy. Um looking back, I will say, like, I think you saw Iowa State's toughness and their resiliency shine through in the second half. Like there are teams that would get down 12 to Illinois early and fold and run away. Looking at you, Duquesne, four spots worse than Penn State. Uh, Iowa State didn't. Iowa State lingered. And we we did say in the preview, again, pat ourselves on the back, how important it was for Illinois to get off to a good start. You saw that tonight yeah. because Iowa State had to play Illinois' game because they were down 10 very early. And uh, you don't want to play Illinois' game. Nobody in the country wants to play Illinois' game. Any final words on this one? We'll do Illinois-UConn preview later this afternoon. Uh, I mean, Dane was seven and six, two blocks, two steals, an assist in 18 minutes. Uh, that attempted behind the back was one of the craziest things I've ever seen. I love you, never change. Uh, I didn't score 90 once again. Not we can we can acknowledge the fact that it was insane to have Dane on the court for defense up six with 15 seconds left. It is, but is it when you actually think about it? Yes. Okay. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Because the only the only way you lose that game is giving up three points in that and spot. Dane fouls a three. <laughs> and Dane fouls a three. And like this is why I will never shake my love for Illinois. Like it's I it would be infuriating to be an Illinois fan because like you they just need to ice the game and Coleman's diving three rows into the stands and Dane's running and hip checking shooters. Like I just, love I love stand it. Stand there. Just stand I, there. No, 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 no. No, Greg. No. This is part of the experience. This is part of it. It would it wouldn't be the experience if we didn't have the dives and the dame. But it's gonna cost them, and I don't want to see Illinois get hurt. I don't want to see this happen to these beautiful fans. I don't want it to happen. I love it. I love it. Too. <laughs> I uh, champagne looked like it was burning down. There, there were mobs of people at the alma mater statue. Chance of we want UConn. Are you uh, are you good with that? No, because I think historically the record on the we want that team when like that's the number one team has ended astronomically bad. I feel like it's 0 for 89 at this point. Yeah, not great. I don't like that either. Uh, More on this in the preview. I would just be extremely clear or extremely afraid of giving Dan Hurley any locker room material. Give and right now we we got we want UConn locker room material, and this is not Brad didn't try to do this, but they stuck a microphone in Brad's face at the end of the game, and Brad was like, "Yeah, I haven't watched them much. Yeah, yeah, I haven't watched them much. Uh, that good team, obviously the champions, one seed. Yeah, I haven't watched them much. Mm. Don't say that shit, Brad. <laughs> like, just I don't care if you haven't seen if you can't name a player on the team. Just look the camera in the eyes and be like." Seen him a ton. UConn is incredible. Just say that. <laughs> That's all you got to say. And uh, good. I will give Coleman some credit. Coleman did a great job. Coleman was like, our respect level is through the roof for this program. It's higher than anybody else. I was like, good, okay. Coleman. good Coleman. Yeah. If, if Coleman's saying responsible things, you should know how dangerous the opponent is, right? Facts. Lock so, in. All right. Uh, good luck. Illinois gets to stay in Boston for another night. We'll have a preview up of Illinois UConn. Good luck, Illini. If you can get to Phoenix, and we're going to be in Phoenix, please, please do that. It would it would make my life so much happier. If you've been watching our videos on the Sleepers Media channel this March, then you know already that our presenting sponsor is my bookie. My bookie is our favorite place to place bets, and you can place bets with us. Card, tell the people about my bookie. Let me tell you about my bookie quickly here. It has absolutely everything you need. It has odds boosts, parlays, expert predictions, alternate lines, anything that you need. My bookie makes it easy to play your way and get paid. And right now we have a first deposit bonus up to a thousand dollars if you use promo code sleepers. That's promo code sleepers for I almost messed that up, Greg, but it is promo code sleepers for a first deposit bonus 
of up to a thousand dollars. The madness is winding down, but there's still plenty of time to get some bets out there. Do so with my bookie, the official sports book of Sleepers Media. Yeah, that's promo code Sleepers, or as Card says, promo code Sleepers. It's promo <laughs> code Sleepers. Uh, thank you, my bookie. Link in the description of this video. Uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching the video. Oh.